Uh-oh, it looks like we piqued your interest in the hideout. First of all, let me tell you what the hideout is not. The hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business, strategic partnerships, and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The Hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever meet them. This is not your typical mastermind. The Hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything, joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, you'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast, where attitude is everything. Uh, the the hideout is coming. I've been telling you guys about it. It just happened uh, the September 23rd through the 25th. It was absolutely transformational. 12 dudes. We were in Utah in uh, Park City. Um, 12 guys had transformations out of 12. 12 out of 12. When you go to a mastermind, a lot of times, one dude will have a transformation. One guy will have an epiphany. But this one, every single one, we were betting 1,000. And now the winter is coming February second uh, through the fourth. It's in Park City. Um, we're saying it's gonna. It's actually gonna sell out before Thanksgiving. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can check it out at kellycardenas.com. Uh, you can apply there. And again, we only allow 12 guys to to come out. So uh, it, and it's amazing, amazing uh, experience wrapped all around getting it back in touch with the joy that a lot of times we lose as we uh, start to move through life. I want to thank every single one of you out there listening that has helped us to be able to get into the top 1% globally as far as podcasts. It blows my mind every time that I hear that or I uh, hear myself say it because it's all because of you who are listening and watching out there. On today's show, I have a young man that uh, honestly, like I've been hearing about him for almost probably about six, eight months. Almost every single week, my buddy Craig says, you need to talk to Chianti. You need to talk to Chianti. Chianti's the man. He is the one. You need to talk to him. He is incredible. And I got on the uh, call this morning with him, and uh, it's amazing to be able to see such a genuine heart. When I asked him about sharing his story, he was like, you know, I, I like to share my story, but I only want to share my story not for the benefit of, of a financial gain, but because I just want to make people's lives better. And I believe that there will be financial gain because of he's making people's lives better. Um, this man uh, reigns from or hails from uh, Stockton, California. So if you're out there on the, in the central coast, not central coast, but the central part of California, you know where Stockton's at, Lodi, Modesto, we're representing today. Uh, graduated from uh, Edison High School in 2007, uh, went into, into the Marines, got uh, deployed there. In 2010, um, it, there was a, a thing that, that happened with an IED, um, uh, took one of his legs off, and um, it's amazing to be able to see and hear what he's been able to do since. He's uh, summited two of the uh, largest peaks in the, in the world since, ran two marathons, and is one of the kindest hearts and kindest human beings that you'll ever meet. We are today, all of us listening, all of us watching, we're going to push this man and demand that he start to tell his story to the entire world because this story is so amazing. He's, he's in college now, and he's, uh, he, he said that the, there's the possibility of him getting his doctorate. I don't think there's a possibility. I think that it's going to happen. And so we're going to push him towards that. But I, I am honored. Uh, I am humbled to have uh, a Marine veteran, hero, and speaker, Mr. Chianti Story, on the podcast. Welcome to the show, my man. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for having me. Um, 
I don't think I've ever had a lead in like that. <laughs> so thank you so much. That was, uh, I was kind of like, Oh wow, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> well, and I tell you, uh, the thing that I didn't mention too is stances to find them. So they, they continue the cycle. You broke the cycle. Can you talk to us about how you were able to break the cycle and for people out there that are in the cycle, maybe how they could start to get out of it? Yeah. You know, I think everyone's circumstances are different, but, but to give you a bit of backstory about me was that, um, you know, in a very condensed version as best as I can, you know, when I was born, my birth biological mom was born on drugs. Um, and so I was obviously taken away, uh, from them, given to my second cousin who, um, eventually adopted me, uh, at the age of eight, 19, I believe that was, um, Paula Williams, my mom. And so she, she raised me all the way until I was about 10 years old, maybe somewhere around there before I went to foster care. And so, you know, some people might be like, oh, well, you know, why this, you know, why'd you go to foster care? Well, you know, reality was there was no legal guardianship and my mom, Paula, um, and hopefully I don't confuse anyone. I, I don't reference my biological mom by name, but in any way, shape or form, uh, she just referenced as biological mom. Um, but my mom was a single mom. She already had her kids, you know, I have, so I have two brothers, two sisters, uh, I'm the baby and foster care was, you know, a, a way that, you know, she could have someone have eyes on me, you know, it was a single mom who, uh, is going through her doctorate program in psychology, um, working full time, working multiple jobs. You know, I, I can look back now that I'm older and say, and, and, and realize that that's a lot for one person. And I think my siblings did the best that they could. I think my mom did the best that she could. Uh, but foster care was a great decision. Um, now <laughs> foster care is kind of where, um, there is a break, you know, as a kid, you feel abandoned. You feel like, oh, this person didn't love me. You, you feel like you did something wrong. Um, and foster care, you know, I, I had great foster parents, uh, um, but they're not your parents. They're not, they're just guardians. And, you know, now that I'm hitting those ages, those teen stages, you know, I'm, you know, rebellious. I don't want to listen to them. And I, I wasn't, I was, I, I have to say I, was, I wasn't the worst kid that they had, <laughs> but I definitely was pushing a lot of buttons that I can say that I should have been relocated from that foster home. But for me, I didn't want to push that button because that would move me further away from my mom. And I didn't want that, despite that we didn't talk as much then, but I didn't want that to happen. To me, that, that would have been worse. Um, and so my mom was that my inspiration through everything that I've gone through in life as a single mom, you know, got her doctor's degree in psychology, raised all, all those kids to me. It was just like, you know, this is my superhero. So I never wanted to disappoint her. And that that's how I made it through foster care and joining the military was my way out of Stockton because if I stayed in Stockton, there was nothing good that I saw that was going to come out of it. There was no, you know, I, I wasn't blessed to have, uh, you know, a family that could provide me to go to college or anything, you know, even though I wanted to be a veterinarian back then when I was young, you know, but there was no, there was no funds for that to happen. There was no, there was nothing once I graduated that I could look at and say, oh, I'm going to have, go this route, I'm going to go that route. It was really graduating high school was the biggest success, <laughs> you know, for me. And I was just like, okay, I need to do something different. And so joining the Marine Corps was, uh, through another friend, actually, who informed me about the Marines, I would have actually joined the army initially, uh, cause I didn't know any better, but my friend, you know, brought me to the recruiting office when I was a junior, I believe in high school and was just like, you, you gotta go check these guys out. And I'm like, all right, I'll go with you, you know? So I go with them and how the Marines carried themselves, how they, you know, went about things was exactly what I wanted when I thought of the military. Um, 
no disrespect to any other branches. This is just the branch that caught my attention. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give all the rest of the branches a hard time. My dad was in the military. He was in the Air Force. But I tell you, all mm -hmm. my Marine friends are all like, you know, my dad will give them a hard time. But you're allowed to give the other branches a hard time, Keontae. You're allowed to do that. So if you're in the Air Force, yeah. the Army, uh, you're in the, uh, what, what, uh, where are we at? Uh, you're in the Navy. Yeah. Uh, Keontae's going to give you a hard time today because he's a Marine. So give it to him. Give it to him. <laughs> yeah. It, it was just how they carried themselves. And that was how, that's what I wanted. You know, like my reason for joining the military was because I wanted to find myself as, as a, as a person. Um, I wasn't raised with a father figure. Um, so for me, it was just like, I, I, I thought the military would show me or teach me how to be a man. Mm. Um, I guess man air quotes, <laughs> but you know, I, I learned a lot, um, uh, doing that. And I, and I think that was a good decision, um, join the military because it got me out of Stockton. And when I went to boot camp, which was here in San Diego, um, I went in, well, before I joined, but I, I guess I went in with the intention of being infantry. Um, now I want to take a moment and kind of, share why I chose infantry because it, it relates to that childhood, um, uh, I guess, when I mentioned about being foster care, when that mental health kind of like changed, infantry was, and I don't really actually tell the story too often, but I think it's appropriate. Um, I chose infantry because, because I wanted to experience war. I wanted to understand what combat was like. Um, and as, as that, at that young age, I didn't really care about the loss of my life. I looked at it as almost a positive, which was, uh, you know, if I, if I died in combat, if I died in the military, there is a, an amount of money that could go to my, my mom compared to dying in the streets of Stockton or dying somewhere else, you know? So more honorable death. <laughs> so Keontae, can, hold on, hold on. For, so at 17 years old, you're thinking, I, I, it would be better for me to die. And so my parents could get some, like, I, I never ha help me with this thought and this, this emotion because at 17, at 17 years old, I wasn't thinking that. And I think there's a lot of people out there that are like at 17 years old, you had that thought that I want to go to war because that would be an honorable death. Like, can you take us into, I mean, take us into the mind of Chianti at that time. I mean, what are, what are some of the contributing factors there? Yeah. So <laughs> Again, I don't talk about this too often. Well, that's um, why you're on the podcast, man. We talk <laughs> about stuff. That's what I, and for everyone out there listening, there's two questions that I ask every single person before they come on the show. Number one, do you have any time constraints? Because I want to talk until we are, our conversation is done. And number two is, I ask, is there anything off limits? And I record it. And Chianti said, there is nothing off limits. So we're going to the places. And I, I invite yeah. you, everyone out there listening, I want you to encourage him. We want to go to the places where you don't really talk about because that's the real conversation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, the way that I looked at it was if I go infantry, then if I die, you know, and, and, and and it wasn't that I, I wanted to die. It was just at, at that teenage stage where you don't know where life is going to go. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. You don't know it, it, what life is supposed to look like. But you're filled with so much anger. And for me, the anger became was because of that abandonment, you know. And. I harbored that, you know, ever since I was young, like I remember looking at other families and be like, oh man, you know, like they have their mom and dad and those kids are so disrespectful to them. Like, man, I, I'd, I'd be so happy just with, with that, you know, or seeing like birthday parties or stuff like that, or, you know, just things that didn't make sense at, at the time, you know, when I was that young, but I was so bothered by that, you know, and felt that, you know, why, what, it doesn't matter what, 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 you know, this, this life doesn't matter all that much. You know, that's how I felt, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I, I always felt like I had something good to do in the world. And that's kind of what I kept telling myself, you know, because, you know, I'm not going to say or lie to you as a teen. Yes. I have thought of suicide and stuff like that, but that's teenage, you know, hormones and all that. Uh, but the way that I looked at 
going to war was one when 9-11 happened you know as time went on obviously i was i was a kid i was still probably i think it was maybe in middle school um when that happened but you know you hear people talk about you know war and this and that and what people are doing over there is you know good and bad blah 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 mostly negative well for me i was always that kid that was just like well you're not there you, you don't know what it's like and how do you know what it like even if it even if there is this going on how do you know that's not lost in translation as it gets back to that other person you know back in the states where where you're safe and far away from danger for the most part um, at least in combat sense <laughs> so going there was i wanted to get my own experience and so that was another reason of going infantry i wanted to experience combat i wanted to see what war was like you know and if i died then hey I, it's i never saw it as a complete loss you know I, respect to all you know my friends who have lost their life respect to all the families out there because war war is you know it's not a pretty sight um and but i made it through um to the other end of you know i finally was able well to the other end at least i got discharged with my life um so you know, so I experienced the war and everything else. And I, I, it gave me a different approach to life. It was just like, oh, you know, like you, you see things differently, uh, especially for those who have never experienced war compared to those who experience war, you see life differently. Um, there is no going back once you see <laughs> war. Um, and so I deployed for, with third battalions of Marines out of 29 Palms, California. Uh, to Iraq in 2008 to 2009. And then, you know, that was very quiet there. Maybe a couple pop shots, nothing really exciting, honestly. Um, everything was honestly transitioning to Afghanistan at that point. And, and 2010, we went to Afghanistan. And so this is where, you know, I really got to experience war. Everything that we thought it should be, everything we heard it should be, you know, everything we trained for, it was there. And, and I was scared. I was young, scared, you know, when you're finally there, experience war, you're just like, oh my God. But with training and everything kicks in, I don't ever recall in my mind where I can say like, oh yeah, I froze up. It's like, no, like I knew exactly what I needed to do. Um, and so in Afghanistan, I was moved up to a team leader, uh, I, 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 I'm speeding up the story a little bit. <laughs> Keonti, a lot do, of me, kind of Keonti do me a favor, though. Take us to the first day when you see stuff getting real. Because you were talking about in 2008, 2009, you know, when you're in Iraq and it, it's kind of calmed down. In 2010, hmm. Afghanistan goes, and it, Afghanistan is going pretty nuts. Am I correct? And oh, yeah. Take us to that first day. The, the, the famous quote by Mike Tyson is, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? <laughs> and then that plan goes all out the door. So a lot of times we train, right? And mm -hmm. if we train hard enough, then we're going to fall back onto our training when this stuff goes down. But a lot mm -hmm. of times when we get into a situation, right? And so I want to I wanna please take us because there's so many people that have never experienced this in their life. And a lot of times they have judgment because they see it from afar. Oh, war is all bad. And you know, I can't believe the people are doing X, but they don't realize that there's people like you that are human beings that you're out there doing your job, you know, mm -hmm. that you, that you have sacrificed. And so take us to the first freak out moment where you realize like this stuff is real. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the first time that kind of hit me, was uh, when we got to Sangin. Um, Sangin is well known for a lot, a lot of casualties. Um, it, it was very uh, uh, big in 2010, maybe 2011, um, the Helmand Providence. So when we first get there, you know, I've already been, we've already been in Afghanistan for maybe Ooh, I want to say three, four months, maybe. And occasionally there's sporadic fire. You know, I remember a mortar landing not too far from our convoy. I remember, you know, but again, a lot more distance, you know, still doesn't create that, you know, uh, oh my God, it's just more of like a, uh, uh, 
how they I think you would describe it like a butthole pucker, pucker. you know, you're just like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> but Hellman was where I think it was real. I was very like right there. And that was because when we walked out of that base where at this time, I believe what was happening was that we were um, working with the Brits and leaving and the Brits had a certain SOP standard operating procedures where they'd go so far. And if they take, uh, you know, contact, they bound back. Um, that was just their SOPs. And so we come in and that's not, you know, our SOPs. We go in and we're going in hard. Um, and, you know, we're out there less than, God, 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, the um, team that leaves before we do, 10 minutes and sure thing, a complete full on firefight, you know, airs being called, mortars are being called, artillery. Um, and you're just like, and I'm still in the compound, you know, at that time, but I'm just like, but we're, you know, we're slowly leaving the compound over time. And, you know, I remember carrying a guy cause we had, a, we had uh, to go out there with a litter and bring a guy back. I believe he was shot in the lot in the lake. I believe he's okay. Uh, uh, forgive me. <laughs> I can't remember who he was, um, but uh, I remember carrying him back and then we get all of our stuff and we're going, you know, we're, you know, bounding to a, another locate a further out location. That's kind of like what we're doing now. Like the Marines come in, we're now moving, trying to take over the space um, and push the enemy back. And so all of that, all of that is what we're trained to do. And so you're terrified, but at the same time, you know, training kicks in if you took training seriously, like, <laughs> you know, because yeah, you know, a lot of things did kind of go out the window where, because it's, you train in a, controlled environment and war is not a controlled environment you know anything can happen from any direction that you can't predict you can assume if you know your surroundings to some degree but you can't predict um and so you know you're listening you know i'm listening to my team leaders squad leaders and all of that and stuff like that and so we're going well now that i think about it i was a team leader <laughs> um at that time i was just uh moved up to team leader right before that uh, push. And I'm only concerned about my Marines, you know, to the left and to the right. I trust them. I know we're going to get things done. Um, but that's my concern. It's like my left to my right, my Marines, getting them in, getting them back, get them, get them out and get home safe. And so we push up um, and eventually, you know, long story short, we eventually get to this compound that's you know, has IEDs. I remember one of the guys was straddling a wall and an IED went off underneath him. He's on a wall, so he was fine, but it was uh, a moment that I was just like, oh my God, what just happened? Uh, so we clear those IEDs, we take over this compound, we kind of inhabit it for, you know, it, it felt like maybe a week. Um, and this is around the time where I'm injured, where I get injured. So, as we're inhabiting this compound, we get intel, or what I recall is that we get intel that we're going to get ambushed. And before this intel came in, we were already having little sporadic pop shots towards us and stuff like that. So we go out, you know, we do a little satellite patrol, a small little um, push out, and and we're doing this early morning, kind of like. If we get ambushed, we have another section that's kind of like slightly uh, out. So yeah, ambush and ambush, I guess the best way to describe it for those who don't know kind of tactics and stuff like that. Um, and so we're doing this early morning and so we're trying to be quiet. I'm a team leader at this time and my guys go inside. Well, we get to this compound and something doesn't feel right. That, that whole morning never felt right to me. And I remember this is because I had a five hour energy drink in my right car cargo pocket. And I was just, I wanted to drink because it, it was early morning. And I'm like, no, I don't know why the thought was just like, oh, if I drink it, if I get injured, I'm going to bleed out. Don't ask me why that, that crossed my mind. But I remember that to this day. And, you know, we have a, you know, minesweeper, you know, so we find a compound, we kick down the door. Um, you know, they go, my team goes inside and there's about, 
I don't know, like 12 of us or so, you know, so I'm with my, uh, gym Marine outside providing outer security. They go inside, you know, they come out, they go back inside, nothing's happening, but I want to know what's, you know, where, where we're trying to go to next, you know, so we're, we're trying to be radio silent. So we're not going to use the low radios because they make this stupid beeping noise. Um, and so mind you that people have already gone inside this building. I go inside this building following the same footsteps because the door has been knocked down. So you kind of have already designated footpath to walk through and an ID goes off. I wasn't assuming there was an IED that would go off because everyone else walked through it. A person has walked back, <laughs> walked back in. There was no way for me to assume otherwise. And this IED goes off and it felt like I was hit by a truck at that point. And so after the IED goes off, I'm laying there. I'm just like, oh my God, what just happened? You know, my ears are ringing. I'm laying down. I'm still conscious. And I think I remained conscious because dirt fell in my ear. I remember that being the most annoying thing out of that entire experience. Um, and I'm tr trying to get my legs to kind of push me against this wall because I know that I'm in a hallway. Like I haven't forgotten where I'm at at the moment. So I'm like trying to push myself uh, against the wall. And so my legs aren't working. So I, I automatically assume I'm a double amputee. I mean, my legs, are, they don't, don't want to do what I'm asking them to do. So I lay there and I know I'm in good hands because, you know, I know my team. So we got a corpsman with us. Um, that's a Navy medical personnel um, with the Marines. And so he comes, well, they sweep up to me. They make sure there's no more IEDs there. Um, and, you know, they get to me. And the only thing I'm telling myself is just like, okay, control your heart rate. You know, um, don't freak out because if I freak out, the rest of the team might freak out or that might make the process even worse for them remain calm. And so I remain calm, you know, I'm talking to the doc, I'm like, doc, you know, he's, he's asking the general questions. I'm already, I've already gone through those questions in my head because I already know what he's going to ask me, but I have to tell myself, you know, and I, I used to do uh, this little like finger tap thing that just tells me that I'm still able to do that. I don't know why I do that, but that was kind of my thing too. And I did that and I'm like, okay, I can still do this. So I know like almost like making sure I'm still where I am in life. <laughs> you know, it's a weird way of describing that. But so I do that. And, you know, the quorum gets up to us, you know, they're, you know, they gives me morphine, banding me, banding me up. And by the time they finish that and get me on a litter, um, I was able to like look down and see what's kind of happening. And my leg is the best way to describe it. Graphic warning is that if you took a chicken bone and broke it, that was my leg, my right leg. Um, left leg, I didn't really see, but that was, you know, the bloodiest thing on my right leg. Um, and I'm like, oh, don't look anymore. Don't want to put myself in shock. Um, just focus on staying awake, you know, talking to the guys, you know, trying to be as positive, I guess, as I could be. Um, so I don't fall asleep. Because the way I looked at it was like, if I fall asleep, you know, I may not wake up. I don't, I don't know the extent of any other injury other than what I saw. So, you know, the, um, my guys get me out of there. They get me on a um, Kazivac vehicle. They takes me to, um, you know, base where I get uh, um, airlifted to Camp Bastion. And I remember getting on this plane and um, holding the uh, flight nurse, I believe that's what she's called. And I remember hurting her, holding her hand as so tight. And I just remember looking at her sweetest woman. I don't remember her, her name or anything, but I remember holding her hand. And I'm like, okay, she, I'm in good hands. Like she's got me. And I remember just kind of like letting go and finally just letting myself pass out and waking up at Cat Bastion after that, my leg, uh, amputated, you know, already bandaged up and all that stuff hooked up and what have you. So, so Keonti, when you wake up, right? So you go through this part. Now, there's so many things that I want to unpack because here, <laughs> here comes, here comes a, a foster kid who has a ton of anger inside of him because of the, uh, you know, some of the stuff, right? And you go into the military, and then what you just said was, as I'm laying on the ground, I'm staying in the most positive mindset that I possibly can, and and you're calmly going through, like I don't want to fall asleep, I don't want to look at this, I need to make sure that my 
attitude is at this place. I don't know that anyone else on earth would be thinking, like, I don't need to freak out right now. I just got hit by a bomb, but I don't want everyone else to freak out too. Take us to that, like, where did you get that? Where did you draw? Where did the positivity, where, where were you able to draw on at that time? You know, honestly, the only thing I, that I remember thinking about the most was if I freak out, the guys might freak out. That That's going to slow down the process. We don't need to slow down this process. So, I, you know, if I'm taking on the fight, I'm missing a leg, that's what it is, you know. But these guys got to make sure, like, if the way that I interpreted everything in that moment was if their mind remains clear, I'm in good spirit, they have a good attitude, things are going to get done. If, you know, because we don't know if there's going to be an ambush after this ID went off. We don't know what's gonna what's gonna happen next, but it keeps everyone, you know, still ready to go. Now, if I'm freaking out, that's more stress, more drilling for everyone else. It's not it's not what I wanted to happen for my team. So, but what I draw, you know, what kind of kept me through all that process too was like thinking about my mom. You know, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna die here. You know, I'm gonna die in the states if anything else. Um, but I'm going to make sure I at least get to a place where like, you know, like I can still like talk to my mom and stuff like that. You know, like it it was just like, my mom was the thing that kind of kept me awake and I kept thinking about them. So I, 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 I pulled upon everything that I knew that would keep me awake, keep, you know, the team kind of morale kind of in a positive way. I mean, they're mad after the fact that I leave, you know, but that's understandable. (laughs) Um, But at least in that that moment when they're doing their job, they didn't have anything else to worry about other than what needs to happen next. And that was if we get ambushed, they're ready to go. If they got to get me to point A, point B, they're ready to do that. You know, they're not bogged down by this excess noise, you know, because that that's going to drain on them. So that's how I looked at that, that that problem. So let me, let me give a big shout out to the Marines and to all the armed forces, because the type of leadership that is taught in the military is second to none. And when I say that, I'm, I, obviously, you were drawing off your mom uh, uh, in that situation. But also you did, Chianti, you did go through training that helped you to be able to prepare for the mm-hmm. type of things that you were going to uh, settle into. And it's mm-hmm. amazing because there's so many different types of, uh, of um, training out there. And but I find that a lot of times people get punched in the mouth and when they get punched in the mouth, they're like, yeah, that was good theory, but I'm out like I'm not going with that (laughs) mentality. I mean, you didn't get punched in the mouth. You got blown up like you got you got hit by a bomb. And in that you were able to like come into uh, it. it, it, it You amaze me anyway. But to hear that and to hear where you stayed mentally, man, is is uh, unbelievable. So let's go to waking up in the hospital because i think uh there it's not talked about enough the the ptsd part of it the depression Mm -hmm. part of it um Mm -hmm. this is not talked about enough i was just talking with and i want to introduce you to him his name is rick allen rick allen happens to be the the drummer for def leppard and he's an amputee right one arm drummer one of the the greatest drummer in the world but he has one arm and Mm-hmm. He he began as he began to talk about PTSD. As he began to talk about it, it became real, and I think it becomes real when you hear somebody's actual story as opposed to us hearing the theory about what PTSD is. Mm-hmm. So take us to that time you wake up in the hospital. Here's positive Chianti, which I wouldn't be positive at that time. But here's positive Chianti. I need to stay calm. I need to get to the states. I love my mom. All the stuff. You're a superhero. <laughs> but you wake up, you look down, take us to that moment. Yeah. So, um, also I just wanted to mention really quick when you mentioned about leadership, they don't teach you how to kind of respond in that situation. And I think in those moments being blown up or being shot, that's kind of a, a, a natural thing that happens. It's either you have it or you don't, your mm. response will be your response. And so I think, I naturally had that response to remain calm and think through it. Um, but I can't say that's for everyone. Um, uh, again, you're only taught to kind of treat other people to, with some medical, you know, knowledge, but being injured you no, know, I think that's a natural response. And so, but I, I do, I do agree that the training has mentally prepared me for such a moment. Um, 
Well, we need, to, we need to give we need to give a big shout out to Paula. <laughs> we need to give a big shout out to Paula, uh, to Mama. And I know uh, your 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 Mama and my Papa uh, went through a very similar thing about with cancer. And uh, we we know where they're at right now, and they're they're probably hanging out partying on streets of gold and, <laughs> in a lot better place than we're at. You know what I mean? Yeah, but we got to we got to mm-hmm. give a shout out to her too because that leadership that she was able to add into you, man, is is unbelievable. So take yeah, yeah. take us take us to the hospital, man. Take us to the hospital. Yes. <laughs> you wake up. I mean, are you are you angry? Are you angry at the world? Are you yelling at God? Uh, what what is what's the emotion that you're feeling? Yeah. So when I wake up at Camp Bastion Hospital, my leg's missing, um, and I'm not necessarily angry just yet. I'm kind of disorientated, and you know, to kind of fast forward through some of this. You know, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm drugged up as well on so many drugs, so I'm kind of loopy as well. But I remember I had the opportunity to call my mom and, you know, letting her know that I'm alive, but I'm now injured. Uh, and I remember calling a friend and that was a, a, a interesting telephone story of how that turned out by the time it got to <laughs> some of them. Uh, but, you know, fast forward a bit from Camp Bastion, I went to um, the base I believe it's an army base in Germany. I completely forgot the name. Launchstuhl. Launchstuhl is the name. And from there, I went to uh, um, Bethesda Hospital. Yes, Bethesda Hospital, Maryland. And I, I'm there. My mom finally, you know, comes in. And still, I, I'm not necessarily mad. I'm, 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 well, I'm not mad that I'm missing a leg. I'm mad that I'm not with my guys anymore. Um, because I'm like, all I'm thinking about is like, man, they're still in combat. They're still fighting it out. And I'm not there. Like I could have done something and, you know, you had to make peace really quickly. Like, you know, there's nothing I can do. I'm missing a leg. I I can't be, you know, with them right now. I got to take care of what I need to take care of right now. So, um, you know, that, that's just the situation I'm in. So fast forward a little bit, you know, I finally get to, um, Naval Medical Center of San Diego where, you know, I'm, you know, I have my prosthetist now, I have my, you know, doctors, I have my physical therapist, um, and all that. So now that's, you know, I'm, I'm now kind of out patient, but still on like my, my role at this point is no longer kind of, you know, sh- doing formations and all this other stuff. I mean, you have to, but it's more about going to your appointments and recovery. Um, and this is probably where I now get mad. I now kind of like how I would describe the saying, like when I would go out go to my appointments and all this, I was wearing a mask, you know, because I'm like, Oh, everyone, I should be happy. I should be positive because that's going to keep everyone else positive and happy. But, you know, as soon as I get to my room, I'm depressed, I'm mad, you know, and I did, you know, I cussed God. I definitely did that. And I was just like, God, like, why am I alive? You know, what am I here? And I remember it was just a whirlwind of just dark emotions of just trying to figure out, you know, like, why am I still alive? Because this doesn't feel better. This feels worse. Uh, You know, I'm caught like I'm in pain and so much that goes on. And and it gets to a certain point where, you know, like I'm abusing my medication to kind of numb all that. You know, I don't, you know, pay medication and, you know, at some point I realized, you know, I've abused it to a certain point that I'm like, I'm not even in pain anymore. I'm just taking it that therefore I'm abusing it, (laughs) but I'm not even, uh, you know, uh, it gets to a certain point that I'm like, this isn't me. This isn't the Keontae that I want to continue going forward as, um, you know, for me, it was, again, it goes back to being born on drugs. So for me, I was just like, no, I don't want to be this. I don't know if I have any genes that might make me addictive to medication like that, but I didn't want to give it the opportunity. Um, I'm like, I'm better than that, you know, so I kind of go cold turkey. I just flush all my pain meds down the toilet. I'm like, that's it. I'm not was, doing any more pain med. Keontae, was there, was there a, uh, a straw that broke the camel's back? I mean, uh, you know, was there something that 
that you said, I mean, was there, did you wake up in a place where you shouldn't be or did you, were you having emotions? I mean, what was it that caused that to happen? Because most of the time there's some sort of catalyst that, you know, when, when the proverbial, I hit rock bottom. Um, mm. So that question, and then can you answer the question too, man, like how slippery of a slope is it and how easy is it when a person takes pain meds for the first time for actual pain how simple and, and easy is it to slide into abusing it? Yeah, so to answer your first question, um, there was. It was, you know, I was taking pain meds to numb the pain, but I was still in pain, like emotional, psychological pain. And, you know, I remember cussing God. I remember just, you know, questioning my existence, wishing I was dead. And it just goes on and on for days and days to a certain point. I'm just like, you know, like if I'm here, then I'm here for a reason. Like, what am I, what is my purpose in this life? And I remember just thinking, you know, like, you know, maybe, maybe I'm here to do, you know, help others. Maybe I'm here to, you know, it, the list goes on and on. It, it comes to a defining point that I'm like, you know, like I'm, I'm here to, uh, well, yeah, I guess to, narrow it down. It was just like, yeah, I'm here to help other people. That's kind of like what I kind of came down to. It, it, it took days. It wasn't just, you know, this hour long or night moment. It was definitely days and weeks of this kind of ongoing battle to when I realized, you know, like, this is just, this is what I need to do. I like, what, like, what do I want to do to be happy? And I was like, I want to go out and I want to, you know, I want to travel. I want to work out. I want to, you know, compete. I want to do these things that, you know, that, I, that makes me happy. And, you know, so flesh and the pain medication was like the start of everything. And as soon as I did that, I went out and kind of figured out, you know, I could do sports, you know, like Paralympic sport uh, camps. And so that's, that was phase one or part one of, you know, getting out of that funk and doing something about it. And the answer to your other question of just like, you know, how hard is it to, you know, get off pain medication. If once you start taking out how slippery of a slope that is, it, it, it can be very slippery. It all depends on how I would interpret it. And I'm sure this is different for everyone. It all depends on that frame of mind that you decide to stay in. And I say mm -hmm. decide because it, to some degree, it's a choice, you know, like, yeah, life, life, life is hard. It's for me, I easily could have abused it. And, and I'm sure some people would have been like all within their rights to be like, yeah, you were, you were struggling like this and that take the edge off. Yeah, but to what point, like at some point that has to stop, but as someone, if, if someone was addicted, it's like you, they would always find a reason. And I never want to give myself more of a reason, mm. you know, because then, then it's difficult, you know, and, 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 you know, there are, you know, I found this out later in life, but in that time, there was a lot of people struggling in, you know, left to the right of me in those rooms, you know, cause we're now in kind of barracks is, barracks, uh, kind of hotel type of places. I have my own room, <laughs> but I have a, I have a neighbor. So we shared one communal space, but you know, down the hallway, you know, there's guys who are in, who's missing multiple limbs, you know, two limbs, three limbs, you know, quads. The way I looked at myself, I was like, I forgive my language, but I was like, I, I can't be a bitch about this. You know, like there's guys who are really su suffering more. So it's like, I, I don't have much to complain about. Like, I'm honestly thankful. I'm lucky because there are people who genuinely, I, I, I couldn't answer those questions for you, you know, but I know in my situation where I'm like, I'm missing a limb. I was, I told myself, I was like, you can still do a lot. You can still do more than others, you know? So figure out what you can do and let's make that happen. So when I went to do the Paralympic camps, um, I chose running, swimming, I chose another sport, but I can't remember, <laughs> but that was, that was, you know, that for me, that was that, that step. And, you know, and, and I, and I want to go back just for a moment because I know like it may raise the question of like, were you ever suicidal? Do you have suicidal ideations? And the question is, yes. Like for me in those moments, I easily have thought about, like, I was just like, I'll just take all the pain meds, be done with it. But to me, the reason why I never could commit suicide even to this day is because I would never know what life could have been. Life in that moment was miserable to me. It was sad. It was depressing. But at the end, I would have 
it doesn't last forever. So if I would have died, then that by taking my own life, I I would look at it as selfish because I could have done so much so so much great things, and I have, you know. And I, you know, even now when I look back, I'm like, wow, I've done a lot of things. But in that moment, I couldn't see that. You're you're stuck in it, you know. This this I'm gonna call it a bubble. I don't know how to describe, it. but you're stuck in this funk that you don't know the future. You don't know where life is gonna take you. But if you end it or you quit, then there is no going forward. There is no way to know what's gonna happen next. And that was kind of how I looked at it. it was just like, you know, I, I don't quit. <laughs> You know, so I'm not going to I'm not going to do this and take that direction, you know, because, yeah, it, life is hard, but life is hard for so many other people, too, you know, but there's again, it, for me, it was just like there's something good that you're alive, you're alive for a reason. If I was meant to die, I, I, I looked at it as I was blown up. I easily could have died there. There there's has to be more to life than just whatever I'm going through right now. So let's 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 figure something out. Let's try to keep moving forward. So Keanti, I want to ask you, I want to ask you a question that might even get me in trouble. Um, but, uh, where is our country and our military and our government failing those who serve in it? You know, that's a, I can't necessarily answer that like directly because I'm sure there are multiple avenues that our country, the government, are failing military personnel who've experienced war, who've gone through, you know, traumatic situations and experienced traumatic injuries, you know, and now pushed out and to some degree just being told here, live your life. Now, there are a lot of organizations who are out there who support these individuals like Simplify Fund, you know, all these other organizations, um, you know, that support individuals like that. But I can't just say directly like this is where they're failing. I, I, it's, I, can I say, do, or do I agree? I, I will say this, the medication to some degree that's being prescribed maybe in large amounts that doesn't need to, that may not warrant that much for an individual. And I think some changes have been made, but I, I, I would say that, but how, how to like solve that, I have no idea. Like, again, there's, I'm sure for every individual, they would have their own story. And I'm, and I, and I have had this conversation with other veterans who've had this kind of, uh, conversation of like oh yeah you know the VA is doing this or this this and this is where they felt us and this so many different areas did my internet come out can you hear me yeah I can I can hear you I can hear you we cut out just for a second okay um, okay but, but what we were talking what we were talking about too is is like what about in as far as Chianti Right. So, I mean, I know that's a broad, mm -hmm. qu my first question was a very broad question. Um, but let's go personal mm -hmm. on it as far as what do you wish going through the situation now, you know, if a, if a person had your exact situation and it came again, I mean, you're such a, uh, an amazing human being and you want to make people's lives better. If a person was mm -hmm. going through that, what would you want to see done differently for that person that maybe you didn't get the type of treatment? Oh, you know, I mean, would it be, would it be, uh, -huh. uh you know, sitting down with, with someone working through it? Would you want to, would you want to have a group setting? Would you want to have people prepare you before you went into war that, Hey, in the event that these things happen and when you come back, you're never going to be the same, uh, you know, and not, not just physically, but also the things that you witnessed, right? This changed your mm -hmm. life. I mean, mm. I, I haven't had to go through those things. Most of us that are listening haven't had to go through things. For those of you out there who have, we want to thank you for your service. But it's not like you can just erase it and be like, oh, well, you know, I could just move on. You saw things that, that will impact you for the rest of your life. And then you had things happen to you that will impact you for the rest of your life. Was there things that you wish you would have been prepared for or 
on the flip side of it too, that when you came back that you would have had the support? You know, I won't lie to you. I think I had, me personally, I had everything that I needed uh, um, because there was a group therapy that went on um, who, um, Vietnam veteran, oh God, I forgot, I, I, I'm blanking on his name, really great guy, but if it comes to me, I'll, I'll definitely mention it. But, you know, he'd come in and people would get together and he was such a positive individual where we would have veterans, all veterans, and he was a uh, fair and as well injured, you know, so we're, we're talking to someone who understands us uh, as new, fresh, injured uh, military personnel, veterans, because uh, we, uh, well, I guess military personnel, because we weren't necessarily discharged at that moment. Um, but he, you know, put on groups all the time. I think it was like Monday, Wednesday or something like that. But I know guys loved him. They went to his meetings. I, did, I think I went to one or two, but it, I wasn't a group setting kind of person, so I didn't go. Uh, so in that, in that, in that event, like, after, you know, because obviously, like, preparing someone before something ever happens is kind of, I don't, I don't think that's useful. Um, it can be overlooked, it might not be useful at the moment. Um, but after being injured, like I had group, you know, group setting with the, uh, other veterans who were injured, you know, there. So, so the support network was there in that way. You know, I had doctors who were there in that way, psychologists who were there in that way, physical therapists. So in when I was injured, I had everything I needed. Um, so I can't I can't look and be like, oh, you know, what could have been improved? Like if I didn't use something, it, it just it doesn't mean like it wasn't there. I just simply didn't use it. And I think that goes for everyone too. Where it's like, now it could be a, you know another person who may not have the same access it may have been overlooked or might be difficult to get same that access to that type of care um then i'd be uh, then i can look at them like okay I, I can see why they're a little mad about that because they didn't have it there why i don't know but for me personally in that hospital at naval medical center balboa i had everything that i needed and i really honestly can't complain because i was set up for success to recover you know and i'm sure a lot of that came from other guys who were injured before me and injured before them who set the pace and tone of just like, hey, we need this in place. Hey, we need this in place. Hey, we need this in place. So by the time I was injured, it was already in place. Wow. Um, so for me, I, I can't, I have no complaints. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's more so on me personally. You know, like yeah. if I if I decide to go a different route and I was just like, screw this or screw that, you know, like I'm bitter, I'm mad. That's, that's on me. That's not on anyone else. So, well, it's amazing. That's, that's that you take, it. Well, it's yeah. amazing that you take the, the type of personal responsibility. I want to, I want to give a shout out to the VA because my, when my pop uh, went through what he did, he, he had a bout with, uh, he started with prostate cancer and it massacized to his bones and um, his, all his treatment was through the VA and they treated him like, he, like he was a king. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, up until his, complete you know tell his dying day um you know they took care of him at the highest level which i think is is you know is phenomenal let's go to this all right so we go to um mad chianti foster chianti graduates from high school paula is whooping his tail and i know that she was so loving with you but i know she whooped your butt too um so <laughs> she whooped your butt you're a bonehead a little bit hanging out with some knuckleheads whatever it was got out of stockton uh got deployed went, or went into the military got deployed uh you know the the ied goes off bang changes of life you come back you're you're depressed you got the the uh the uh pain meds happening but then you get to that point and you're like you know chianti is here for a reason right mm -hmm. let's talk about about that 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 overcoming Chianti then starts running marathons, starts getting involved with para, uh, para games, um, starts you know you you summited uh, Kilimanjaro like I mean and then <laughs> I said it wrong. Say the other one, Vis Visim Massif. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mount Vincent Massif. Okay, you said it so much cooler. I messed it up earlier. <laughs> But let's yeah. talk about that guy because I mean that dude that that is phenomenal, and I mean you the massif is in Antarctica, am I correct? Yes. Yes. 
I wouldn't even go to Antarctica in the first place. It's a little bit too cold for me. Um, but you went there on purpose <laughs> and then <laughs> wanted to summit. So where, where does the mindset part kick in for you again? Because then the lion comes, right? And that's the lion that we see today, right? And I appreciate you taking us through the, the other part of the journey. We're going to go back to some of them because I got some good questions for you. Um, okay. But let's go into the lion part because now, I mean, you're that apex predator. You're going after it. You're grabbing life. Uh, you know, take us into that mentality now and where, where you're well, like on a day-to-day basis when you're waking up, what do you, you know, what, what are you thinking and where are you taking yourself? Yeah. So once I started doing, uh, uh, well, so once I got out of the pain meds, I was able to get uh, the ability to go to Oklahoma to do the Endeavor Games. Not the Invictus Games, the Endeavor Games. This is in Oklahoma. <laughs> and so this is my first time doing anything para anything. And so I did running, swimming, and I believe one other sport. But I was recognized for sprinting. You know, I get there i don't have a running blade i don't have a running leg i don't have i don't even run (laughs) but i get out there and i get i do the first 100 meters and i get like a i don't know like a 15 something you know and everyone's like oh my god that's a very like i i get a medal but i the medal meant nothing to me because i felt like it was really slow um but i had the head paralympic track coach come up to me and say, hey, you have a lot of potential. Do you have a running leg? And I tell her, like, no, I don't have one. And she's like, you should, you should get one and look into track. Like, you have a lot of potential. And I was like, okay, you know, like, it, it was the first time someone told me I had potential at something, and I was just like, okay. So I, you know, I, I get back to, you know, the hospital. I talk to my PT, and you know, I talk to my prosthetist, and they're like, yeah, you got to talk to this individual. And, um, who's part of like, he runs the agility clinic and we can get you a running leg and what have you. Well, the agility coach happens to be an Olympic athlete, <laughs> um, like a gold medal Olympic athlete, I believe in the 800 meters. And so I tell him about it and, you know, we do this agility course and blah, blah, blah. So I can get my running leg. Cause I'm, I'm excited. I'm like, I, I get to do track. And, um, so I start work with him. And this is how I get into track where I start doing the hundreds and two hundreds, um, meter sprints. And, you know, at first it was a lot of people around me who supported me. They're like, yeah, you know, you're going to be awesome. You're going to be the next Paralympic athlete. Well, mind you, I didn't know what a Paralympic athlete was, (laughs) you know? So I knew nothing about, you know, being a Paralympic athlete. I I had no desire from a young age to be an athlete. But here I am with the ability to be athletic. Therefore, I'm sure I could have been great when I was younger if I played something. (laughs) But I didn't play any sports as a kid. I didn't play any, you know, football, basketball, anything like that, you know, to higher degrees like college or not college, high school level basketball, football or anything like that. You know, recreational stuff with friends, yes. But to now be told I have potential to be a great sprinter and have a lot of support around me who's just, you know, tell, you know, push me to be up next pair. Like, actually, I'm like, sure. You know, so I, I take track. Um, lo and behold, I'd rather, I, I, I wish I would have did snowboarding, but I lived in San Diego, so there was no snowboarding. I, <laughs> um, <clears throat> nor knew I, did I know how to even approach that, you know, direction, but I went snowboarding one time and I was like, I want to do this, but track was very convenient. So I did that and that kind of pushed me. Like I found something I was passionate about. I enjoyed being on the track. And so that's just one area of like me being athletic. Well, as I'm starting off in the hospital, uh, uh, another guy approached me and he, he just came back from his summit of, I believe Kilimanjaro, Mark Zambon and great guy, uh, bilateral, yeah, bilateral above the knee amputee, I, be, I believe, yes. And he just did his summit in a Kilimanjaro. And I'm like, man, that's so cool. Like, I remember seeing his news on the, uh, his face on the news, talking about it. I'm like, dude, that'd be so cool. And I met him in passing, but I didn't, like, talk to him like that. And he approached me one day, and he was just like, yo, like, you have a lot of potential. I've seen you run. Like, would you be interested in doing, you know, 
um, working with the Heroes Project and doing one of the seven summits. And I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it. Um, so I, I get on a call, I talk to the, uh, the head there at the Heroes Project, Tim Medvets, and he's like, yeah, the next one we have is uh, Antarctica, Mount Vincent. And I was like, sure. Didn't know where that was. Didn't know how cold it was going to be. I knew nothing about it other than I got to finish off my season in track. <laughs> and then I can do all, I can do all of that. So I, I, I make it to, um, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's right before they choose. So it was, this was 2012. So it was right before they pick and choose who can go to the Paralympics. Um, forgive me. I'm blanking on the names of things, but anyways, I go through that. And that was my first time at such a, to me, this is a big event. Like I'm, I'm, I'm in blocks next to the fastest amputee in the world or one of them at the time, you know, and other, you know, competing athletes as well. And here I am a year out of my injury running and at this level, I'm like, holy crap. To me, I was just like, I have something that I didn't know I had. So that, that experience kind of pushed me to continue track. Now that track season has ended, I'm now on to climbing a mountain. <laughs> and, you know, from Stockton, everything's flat. So I've never really hiked outside of the military. So now I'm with Tim, we're doing all the training up for Mount Vincent. We're doing cold weather training. We're doing, you know, getting the gear ready for, you know, uh, really just trying to figure out like my prosthetic and stuff like that, what needs to happen? What do I need to be aware of? What do I need to do? You know, what do I need to take care of, monitor? And January of 2013, we are now at Antarctica, Mount Vincent Massif base, you know, ooh, excuse me. And we start hiking up. I was not prepared for that. <laughs> no matter how much training I did, no matter how much, how motivated I was, I was not prepared prepared for that weather um the you know you're you're hiking in crampons on ice you're carrying you know 45 in your pack and then like 30 something thought pans on a sled it could be somewhere closer to 100 divvied up but i was not prepared for that and so i'm going you know hiking up you know we get to camp one and then we get up to camp two and it was in between high camp and camp two where i questioned if this was something that i even wanted to finish i had so much doubt in myself because this set off of just being a more personal endeavor i wanted to challenge myself i'm like i'm an amputee but i'm not going to let that you know define me i'm going to keep pushing and so you know on the way to high camp i was just like thinking to myself i was like i can stop now and i'm I'm honestly satisfied with my accomplishment, you know, but I'm not, but I, I wasn't really okay with like just quitting, you know, like, I'm like, oh man. So I thought about it and I remember just thinking about the Marines that I was with, that was in Afghanistan with me, all my guys just kind of like, as I'm hiking, I remember just thinking about them and just laughing, you know, of them just talking crap about like, man, here's this black guy and all this cold, like, you know, you don't see that, you know, it just, it, it just made it so much, it, it made it funny, but it brought, it gave me almost a new purpose of that climb. And that was, I want to do it for them. I had the Marine Corps flag in my backpack and I was like, I'm going to get to the summit. But at the same time, I kept thinking as I was going up, I was like, man, I want to motivate others. I want, I hope others, when they see that I made it to this summit, that they can look, they can, you know, see me and realize how, what I accomplished, that that'll motivate them as well. So it became bigger than me very quickly. And I was just like, okay, this is my, this is my purpose. This is what I want to do. Not saying the climb up there was easy, you know, but, you know, we get to the summit and I cry, I break out, you know, I'm crying, you know, and it, sur it's, it was very surreal for me to be on the highest mountain in the world. And this is now three years out of my in outside of my injury. Well, technically less than three years. And 
I've done something I didn't think I would be able to do. I've accomplished something I never would have thought in a million years I would be doing. And, you know, the first thing I do is I call my mom. <laughs> you know, I call my mom, I tell her I'm on top of it. And, you know, she's so proud of me. I'm so happy. I talked to her. And it was just, it was the defining moment in my life that changed everything, that changed the trajectory of like my mentality. Because I knew from that point I could do anything that I put my mind to. I think we had. Uh, Can you uh, hear me? Yeah, I think, uh, Keontae, I think we, we had you uh, cut out just for a second. I think we have you back. Do we have you back right now? Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah. So you were saying that it that that, that, that that part politics. that part really defined you, right? And so or, yeah. or, or defined a whole new part of it. Now the 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 thing that I want to go into right now, Keonti, is when you got when we started talking, right? Today earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were telling me about that you're in school right now. I asked you what you were doing recreationally. You said, I'm in school, so that takes up a lot of my time. You said that you like to walk, you know, you like to be with your dog and you, you're working out and all the stuff. And then you said something that doesn't really add up. You said, Oh, well, if I can, I'm going to get my PhD. Now, the reason why I say it doesn't fit is because, okay, let's take it back. Stockton, right? Stockton, represent. Foster kid. Mama Paula. Knucklehead. Graduates from high school, goes into the military, gets uh, deployed 2008, 2009, goes up to Afghanistan, leg goes off. Okay, goes through uh, uh, pain meds, gets off of them on his own, flushes them on his own. And then says, you know what, I'm going to go out and I'm going to, I'm going to be a sprinter with only one leg. And then is in the blocks next to the, the, the one of the fastest guys in the world after a very small amount of training, but it's just something inside of you. And then, oh yeah, let's go and climb the highest mountain in the world, <laughs> carrying a hundred pounds on my back. And then I'll summit it and get to the top remind you that this is only with one leg foster kid who wasn't supposed to get out of Stockton. So the thing that I'm saying that, that doesn't add up is if, 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 if I get my doctorate, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, Keonti, <laughs> what is it that you struggle with now? I'm not, I'm not talking about the, the, the leg part. I'm talking about the mentality wise. What do you struggle with now? Because everyone out there listening is like, well, this dude, seriously can do anything like you can do anything that you oh, yeah. set your mind to right yeah. so on a on a day-to-day -day basis though what is what does Chianti struggle with oh when it comes to school it's and i'm not talking so... about just school Chianti. i'm talking about <laughs> you know what i'm saying because if i hear that story if i'm reading that book right mm -hmm. if i'm reading that book which Chianti, do you have a book right now I do not have a book. Okay, so we need to write a book. And when I say we, we aren't going to, I mean, I, I, there, there's someone out there listening, and I have friends that can help you to be able to write this book. But you need to write this book because there are so many kids out there, and we're, we're just about to go back to the foster kid part. Don't, uh, don't get it twisted. You're, you're not out of that yet. You're not out the weeds. But you need to write a book about this stuff. And the reason why I'm saying it is because the, the story is so impactful, but also too, like, I mean, if you hear this, anyone that's listening is like, well, I mean, I'm just seeing this trajectory and now Chianti, uh, he just sets his mind to something. He's going to go do it also, you know? Yeah. So, but, but also too, we understand that you're a human. I, I don't think you're a human. You're a superhero. I mean, you're, you're Iron Man now. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like you know, when you want to run faster, you put on a different leg. When you want to climb the mountain, you put on a different leg. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> you're Iron Man. <laughs> but also you're a human being. What do you struggle with, bro? Well, for your, I should, well, I mean, if I'm going to be honest with you, I struggle with depression, you know, anxiety. A lot of these things have gotten better and they've gotten better after I decided to take a break from pushing myself athletically. So 
what I mean by that was that, you know, for years I, you know, I was pursuing the Paralympics in track. So I'm constantly, you know, I'm competing at high levels. I'm, you know, climbing mountains, like, you know, summit at Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, Cotopaxi with the range of motion projects. Um, you know, I'm, you know, running marathons, I'm pushing myself in, you know, athletic endeavors. And it was fun. I, I enjoyed that. I loved that. But it's a, it's a big commitment. It's a, it takes a lot of my time. And I recognize that when I stopped, when I made that decision to say, hey, I'm going to take a, a break from the Paralympics in 2018, I actually decided to act, uh, quit my job as well and said to myself, I want to go to school. Um, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to work this job. I, I just hit a certain point that I, I, I felt like things had to change. And when I made that change, I recognized that I was very depressed. I actually do suffer from PTSD. I realized that I had a lot of things that I didn't unpack. And I think sports was my way of coping, but ignoring that mental health area that I needed to unpack. Um, because I would have moments of just where, you know, I'd be emotionally mad or I, it, it, these emotions would come up and I wouldn't know why. Um, and it wouldn't make sense. So I spent years from that point, actually, you know, seeking therapy, talking to others, really just taking care of myself on that level. I felt physically I'm healthy, I'm well, but mentally let's, 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 let's figure this section out while going to school. And so, because I now have more time when it's school to take care of myself and that, that's what I did. And so at this point in time, I'm a lot better with my mental health um, because I kind of recognized those demons that I was battling. And, you know, I guess I would say I organized them <laughs> to where they're not like controlling me. They don't define me in any way, shape or form. It's more of recognizing that this is me. This is what I've gone through. But at the same time, this is how I've gotten out of those spaces and recognizing that, yeah, you know, just almost admitting to myself, yeah, I do struggle with certain things, but I don't let them define me. I recognize how to manage them. And so that way I can live a happier, healthier life without, you know, always feeling depressed all the time and not knowing what to do or always feeling, you know, you know, getting, getting stuck in this dark space and not knowing what to do. It's they've, they've changed over time. So it's like, I might've done one thing like, yeah, I'm going to go for a walk and that might help my depression. Well, it's like, well, what if that doesn't work? There's definitely times when that happens a lot where I do something that should work to help treat what I, you know, is what I feel is going on and it doesn't work. So I always have to stay on top of these things. Um, and sports was just that one thing that always worked. So that's why I'm always active. Um, I'm a big proponent of be active. Don't be sedentary, get out and go do something. Um, I think it helps mentally as well as physically. Um, I mean, I, I, I can, I know studies that show it just helps you all around. So just go out and be active. So even if it's just walking, go out and walk. Um, but you know, so now that I'm in 2022, I've taken care of myself. School is kind of that thing where it's like, I look at school and say, I, I like school. I love learning. I want to be able to help others. I want to work with athletes. I want to work with people with disabilities, amputees. I want to work alongside the Paralympics if I can, you know, be a part of them, you know. And so being a doctor in physical therapy, being an athletic trainer, that's what I, I would love to do that for the Paralympics, you know. And so so when you ask me, you know, what's what's bothering you or what's going on or what's wrong or something like that, it, it I don't like sitting in classrooms. <laughs> you know? So, so Keonti, so Keonti it's, it's, do me a favor though. <laughs> say, look into the camera and not say, you, you just said it again, right? You just said it again. I would like to. No, it, look into the camera and say, I will. I will be a doctor. <laughs> I, if that's your desire, I'm not saying you have to do that, but look into the camera yeah. and say, I will be a doctor with the Paralympics. <laughs> I will not be in a classroom and I will be in, you know, outside and working with people. Say that, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, I know I will. There we go. That, that's, that's, the, that's the biggest thing is like, I know I will. It's just, will I be a doctor in physical therapy? Maybe, maybe not. Will I be an athletic trainer? 
Maybe, maybe not. But will I be working with the groups that I want to be working with? Will I be able to work and be happy doing what I'm doing? Yes, I, I will definitely be doing that. And so there's no doubt in my mind, that's what I want to be doing. <laughs> um, but that's where I, I, you know, going through school, I recognize like, cause also, you know, obviously being blown up, like I suffered a TBI and I'm not trying to make any excuses. I've made it this far in school. I'm very proud of myself and how far I've made it with, you know, just in my memory improving. But I also recognize where I'm sitting down a long period of time. I'm like, I'd rather be doing something else, <laughs> you know, in, my, in the classroom. So <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's just, a, it's a battle, you know, and I'm sure other people go through that and I know I can get through it. I know I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll keep doing good in school, getting good grades. It takes me a little longer than others, but that's the, that's the process, you know, um, for me and I'm okay with that. But, uh, yeah, so that's, that's me in school. And so, um, and also, I didn't actually mention now that I said 2022, uh, as I say, I'm like kind of done with uh, sports and all that. I was invited to the Victus Games in tw uh, earlier this year, uh, where I won a gold medal in the 100 meter sprint and four by one. Um, I, I will admit that I wasn't in the best shape that I could have been, uh, but I was very honored and proud to be there um, and compete for uh, Team USA alongside other veterans from all branches it was it made me so happy and it made me miss you know that 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 experience when you are competing and being amongst others who have the same you know just hunger as you when it comes to sports you know of just getting out there you know putting it all out and you know seeing the end result and it, it was it was a great experience i, I really loved it uh, i'm trying to do next year 2023 um, Germany. So we'll see how, we'll see if I get selected for that one. Keontae, you, you just said you won two gold medals and you weren't in that good of shape. Do you think that there's any question <laughs> that you're going to, that you're going to make it, that you're going to be chosen? I mean, you dude, you're an absolute superhero. I want to do some rapid fire. Okay. I'm going to give you 15 seconds, uh, 15 seconds with these questions, 15 seconds, meaning you give it this, uh, you give a quick bit of advice for this person. I'm, I'm going to list them off. You give the advice. That's is that cool. Okay. All right. All right. Foster kid. Um, from one foster kid to another, you know, don't let your circumstances define you, you know, like whatever you're going through in life is not, not your fault. You know, you were born into this life and that's kind of how, um, life has played out, but it's you being in foster care, you know, doesn't mean that people don't love you. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to do great things in the world. And it's hard to see at that time, but you know, as you continue going forward in life, you will see how good of an impact you are to others around you. All right. Knucklehead, uh, high school kid. Uh, stop being stupid in high school. Um, you know, in high school, you know, we, we get consumed by our hormones, our friends. We want to be an adult very quickly, but don't rush the process of trying to grow up too fast and allow, and, 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 try to stay on track so that way you set yourself up good after high school because high school is just a moment you know after high school you're not an adult it's you have to take responsibility for everything that you do from that point on so don't think that high school is going to carry forward you know your friends going to go with you um you know take care of yourself do what you need to do whether it's go to college get a job you know take responsibility for you african-american male in america Oh, that's a hard one. I wasn't, I think I didn't need more than 15 seconds. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as, as an African-American, I, I, I it, it's a, it's a struggle, you know, like we're, we're born into this, you know, skin tone that, and we're, we're treated differently, you know, because of that. And it's, it's hard to kind of get away because it's not, you know, a personality thing that can change. It's not a, you know, uh, it's not anything that you can just change, you know, it, it's, a, 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 in America, it has created the stigma of looking at people of skin color, people of color in a negative light. And I think at this point in time, we're starting to assert ourselves in a way to where we are seen and heard and respected, but it's still going to be a long journey. So don't think that this is going to last forever. It's just 
we're making small changes for the future of our, I don't know if kind is the word that I want to use or skin color, but changes that we will not probably be in our lifetime, be able to witness, but big changes down the road for our kids, grandkids, future generations. I'll allow you when you went over the limit on that one. <laughs> I'll allow that. Uh, new kid in the Marines. New kid in the Marines. Simply know why you're there. You know, if, you know, if whether it's your mom, dad, whatever reason, know why you made that decision to join the Marines while you're in the military, because when times get hard, when things get tough, you need to know why you made that decision to be there. You know, be, it, it's, it's, it's your decision, not anyone else's. I mean, unless you were held at gunpoint, so be it, <laughs> but know why you why you made that decision and continue pushing yourself and bettering yourself because whether it's four years, eight years, 20 years, you know, you're going to be a better person because of that, but know why you joined, why you stand on those yellow footprints and why you are, um, why you are carrying yourself as a Marine. A person who just took fire, whether it be an IED or gunshot wound and has now lost a limb. Hmm. Stick to the 15 seconds too, <laughs> man. I'm just joking with you. <laughs> so, so, you know, for someone who just, you know, suffered a catastrophic injury, whether a gunshot wound or IED, assuming you're in good, you know, health care, you have good support around you, you know, at this time that you're recovering, that is all you need to focus on is recovering, you know, mental, mentally, physically, emotionally, that's all you need to be concerned with. And so taking care of yourself, you know, talking to those around you that you trust that you, you know, that are there for you to kind of where you can open up and actually be honest with those individuals and just being real with yourself, you know, like life, I don't know the extent of the injury, but to some degree, maybe life has now changed for you and you have to now adapt. And that is, a, you know, a product of being a human is that we can adapt to all situations that, you know, we could, we find ourselves in. That's, that's a great thing about us is that we adapt. I, I think as most animals, we adapt. <laughs> And so you have to now adapt to your now, your now new normal. A person who is on pain meds for a reason and is just starting to slip into darkness. If you're on pain medications and you're on it for a reason, if you're slipping into a point of darkness, this is beyond, this is no longer pain medication. This is more mental health. And I advise you to seek and talk to someone um, because you have a lot that's going on and, and seeking therapy, talking to, a, you know, a, 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 someone who can help get some of these words out of your mind, you know, and out into, you know, the open out of your mouth is going to help you so much more. And obviously getting off those pain medications or a lower dose is ideal. Um, but that would be my, my suggestion. A person who has never realized that all of their journey is going to be the message that they send to the world. <laughs> um, can you repeat that question? A person who doesn't realize that their entire journey is now going to be the message to the entire world. I think that is just the story of our lives. <laughs> um, you know, like to that individual, you never, you can never look back and say, oh, this is what I wanted to be, or this is what I thought it would be. Like that works out for some people, but life comes at you from all angles. Things happen in life and that throws off, throws us off in different directions as we get older. Um, but every step of your life, you know, is every, yeah, every step of your life is part of your story, you know, that you can share with others. And you may have experienced something that someone else hasn't experienced, but 
you also may experience something in a different way that someone experienced. And that's, you know, now you can connect with that individual or share your story that could help that individual. Um, not everything has to be, you know, equal. Like, you know, you experience a gunshot wound, someone else experiences a gunshot wound. It doesn't have to be like that, you know, like mental health is something that we all experience, whether good, low, bad, indifferent, you know, we can all relate mentally to each other. Our experiences may look different, but we can all relate to some degree one way or another. A person, uh, what do you, what advice do you give to a person in 15 seconds that doesn't realize their potential? If they don't realize their potential, then, you know, we all have potential. Like that's flat out the truth. We all have potential to be good, great, amazing at something. Go out and find what you're good at. You know, don't, and you have to be honest with yourself. Like there's, you know, like if you want to be a good painter and you suck at painting, like that takes practice. But if you're really good at basketball, but you want to be a painter, you, then you're really good at basketball. You should pursue basketball, you know, and painting should just be something you do on the side and enjoy, you know, but we're all good. At, we're all great at something, you know, it's up to you to figure out what that is, hmm. you know, you know, you have that support around you. You might even have people kind of, um, kind of bring you down, but if you feel within you that you're going to be good at something, pursue it. Don't quit. Keep pushing at it. What advice do you give to a, a, a young man who was born on drugs, uh, who had had a kind of strained relationship with his birth mother, won't say her name, and uh, has now lived a, a life and is inspiring people all over the world? <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, as someone who, obviously me, I can look back and I don't re regret or have any ill will or any negative kind of feelings towards my upbringing. I think my upbringing has created or, or allowed me to be the person that I am today. And I would never want to change that for any other reason. Um, uh, you know, I wouldn't be me if I didn't go through all that. And that is my story that I can now share with others um, and, and, and share how I made it a positive story where it easily could at any turn been a negative story. My entire life <laughs> could have been a negative story, <laughs> but I chose to make it a, a, a positive story as much as I can for myself. And so I would always want to, you know, look back and be like, you know, if I could say thank you to that person, I would say thank you to that person, but she's now deceased. <laughs> So. If, if you got a chance to sit down for 30 seconds with your birth mother, who, you know, when you were saying earlier, you said to, to, to help the confusion, I'm not going to say her name. But if you got to sit I down with her, if, if you got to sit down with her and you had 30 seconds and then she was going to go back to, you know, she was going to go back to where she's at now, what would you say, Chianti? Okay. Before we start the timer, <laughs> when you mention birth mother, you mean mom, not biological mom, correct? Bi bi biological mom. Biological mom is a person I've never met. So if you got a chance to sit down with biological mom okay, for 30 seconds, what would you say? I would say that you have given birth to a wonderful kid that you missed out on seeing uh, his life uh, unfold. And although you weren't in his life, he thanks you for giving him a life for him to live. And despite all odds against him, he's still thankful that you gave him life for him to live his own life and make the choices that he made. What if you had 30 seconds with, with mom? Oh, uh, that's a little harder. <laughs> uh, you know, my mom, you know, she's, you know, if I had 30 seconds, just thank you. I love you and I wouldn't be who I am without you. You raised me to the best of your ability and you adopted me, you know, I'm, I'm your kid and I couldn't be, I can only say thank you, you know, for just being in my life talking to me, 
being that person I can talk to and just, just being that inspiration for me. And I, and I don't know if you know that you were that inspiration for me, but you've always been the inspiration for me since a young, since a kid, you know, you're my superhero and it, it's hard to live life without you. And I wish you were here, but I hope what I'm doing in life is still making you proud. And I hope that wherever you are, you know, you're still looking down, just smiling and being proud of all the things that I've done and still doing. I think all of us can uh, attest to the fact that she is proud as can be. She is beaming. She is, she is, she is jumping up and down. She's dancing on streets of gold, man. And I want to encourage you in that. I started the podcast because of my kids. Everyone out there listening, you know exactly what this is. Uh, Maddox and McKenna, uh, my life, my joy, my, my wife, uh, Brooklyn. And um, Maddox and McKenna are t- uh, 11 years old and 13 years old. Maddox is the athlete in the family, and um, McKenna is the, uh, is the artsy one. She found theater, and she found performing arts, and she is just on fire. So I started the podcast because I wanted to take iconic people like yourself. I wanted to take superheroes in this world, and I wanted to have real conversations to show my kids that there's no such thing as idols in this world, and I don't want them to worship anyone. I'm all, I want them to be inspired by people and icons like you. But the fact that you're a human being and you have blood running through your veins makes them see that anything in this life is possible. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both of their names, it would be awesome. Yeah. So for Maddox, since you're the athlete, it sounds like in the family, you know, you're always going to look at whatever sports you're playing, you know, those individuals, the way I look at it is that they're human and you equally being human can be to that level if that's what you want to be doing in your life, you know, whether it be basketball, football, I don't know what sport you're playing, but you could be to that level. Um, And for McKenna, you know, you know, arts is a wonderful thing. Um, I was introduced to theater a couple years ago from a friend and I think plays and Poetry and music and paintings are a wonderful thing that tells a story in a different way. And so if your passion is arts and theater or, you know, uh, I don't know the whole umbrella term for that, but if that's your thing, then, you know, go out and pursue that because you're going to make a lot of people happy. You're going to inspire a lot of people. And I'm sure whatever you end up doing will just be enjoyed by all. Keati, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being on the show, man. I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for being an inspiration in my life. Like, yeah, and honestly, like, I don't know if I want to be that close of friends with you because you make me see that anything is possible. And sometimes I just want to be lazy and just hang around and be like, you know what? It wasn't meant to be. But if if you obviously (laughs) listen to Keati, you realize that you don't have any excuse in life anymore. None. Absolutely none. If you're a foster kid, no excuses. If you're a bonehead in high school, no excuses. Um, You know, if if you went through and you you had bouts of depression or you struggled with, uh, you know, with pain meds or, you know, you're an amputee. You don't have any excuses anymore. Talk to Chianti. Get yourself around him. I, I, I just, I thank you, man. You're a superhero. Uh, I want to get you around thank as you. many people as possible. And I'm going to stay on you, man. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. On Tuesdays at 7:30 in the morning here in Carlsbad, okay. 7:30 to 8:30. I'm going to ask if there's ever time when and there's a time when you don't have class during the summer or something. And, uh, you know, I want to I want to be able to get you around. But I just I want to thank you so much, man. I want to thank you for your service. And you are just an absolute phenomenal human being. Now is the time. Anyone out there listening, check the sponsors, do the things that you know you need to do. And we want to thank you all for all the things that you've helped us to be able to do with the podcast. We just went over a hundred thousand downloads and it's all because of every single one of you, um, still, uh, keep representing the Oilers or the Titans, uh, cause there's no other team on the planet, but <laughs> Chianti, uh, you are a, a, an incredible man and I, I love your heart, man. And I just, I'm, I'm excited to get you around some people, um, that, that are going to continue to, to push you, uh, into that, into that gift. And uh, if you're out there and you have a company um, that needs a speaker, 
you know where to find him. Uh, he's on Instagram as Keonti Story, and uh, you need to reach out to this guy. This guy is uh, is doing the right things for the right reasons, and the right things keep happening. So I want to encourage you, my man, and I want to thank you again for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a, a wonderful time being able to speak on your platform, and just I enjoyed all of your questions, and I'm sure – you know, we can go for hours and hours of just really unpacking and talking in more detail about my life and my story and each one of those. But, you know, it, it's, we've only, how I always say in most podcasts, we've always just skimmed the surface, even though you asked a lot of great questions that kind of dig a little bit deeper. A lot of it was still skimming the surface, but it, it, it really showed a lot of what my life is in a condensed version. Um, and I thank you for allowing me to share openly and honestly on your platform my story and hopefully it inspires so many people who hears uh my story in your podcast or on your platform well everybody's inspired man and we're gonna so that leads right into it we're gonna get you scheduled again i want to have you on again and again and again and we're going to continue to unpack this canty but you're going to be my friend for the rest of your life because i'm going to force that to happen right. <laughs> um, I, I love you a ton man and you are officially off the hot seat